The last presentation is going to be by Mike Bumgartner. Um, he runs our um, North American um, office based in, in Vancouver, um, and he was instrumental in uh, winning a project for us um, with the Northwest Territories, one of the um, provinces in, in Canada, to provide more than a land system, more than a mining cadastre system. Um, but I'll hand it over to, to Mike to exactly explain um, the full scope um, of that project. Thanks, Mike. <clears throat> All right, thanks, Bill. So I just realized why Bill gave me this slot. And it's because it's 6 a.m. in Vancouver, and I'm up and ready to rock and roll. <laughs> so uh, there you go. So while the rest of you are going to sleep, I'm waking up. All right, let's get into it. So, a um, couple of facts about the Northwest Territories. Uh, it's located in the northwest um, corner of Canada. Uh, it's in the Arctic, so it's very cold. Um, I have been up on a mine site there when it's been minus 65 degrees uh, with wind chill. Uh, and so if you're not properly kitted out, you die in about five minutes. Um, the population of uh, the Northwest Territories is only 45,000 people, in part because it is a very hostile environment to live. <laughs> yeah, uh, but that being said, um, <clears throat> they do have a lot of industry uh, and their, their predominant uh, revenue generator is mining, um, you know, across uh, multiple different commodities. And they also do have a pretty significant tourism industry, people going to visit the Northern Lights, um, visiting the beautiful national parks, um, and for hunting and fishing. And as a result, they have one of the highest per capita GDPs of all of the Canadian provinces. Um, the GNWT government is interesting in that they do not have any political parties there. Um, they have a legislative assembly that's responsible for um, getting all of the regulations and things um, passed through, through their parliament. Um, so just a little bit of a different uh, kind of regulatory model there. So a little bit about the, um, about the actual project. So the project's called the Land Tenure Optimization System. It's sponsored by the Department of Finance, um, which is obviously a parent division to you know, uh, a lot of the different uh, ministries and things. Um, and the reason that they're sponsoring it is that this particular project actually spans um, multiple use cases, as, uh, as Bill alluded to earlier. So it's a little bit of everything that we've seen today all rolled into one. I'm going to start singing. <laughs> OK, uh, it was an open tender. Um, the RFP submission was in uh, January of 2021. Um, it took about uh, eight, nine months to get all of the uh, exacting requirements and contract and everything negotiated, but we kicked off the project in November um, of 2021. Uh, with a primary goal of establishing uh, a standard system architecture to deliver an integrated and collaborative technology en environment to manage all of the Northwest Territory's surface and subsurface land tenure information effectively in a single system. So that mean meant involving uh, multiple divisions, um, a territorial land admin division, which looks after um, land um, surface and subsurface outside of the established communities. Commissioner's Land Administration, which looks after land in, um, you know, within settled communities. Uh, Milliam and, uh, Mineral and Petroleum Resources Division. The project split into uh, three iterations for lands, oil and gas, and minerals. Uh, they're going to be between 50 and 100 internal users of Landfolio, and then about 5,000 external customers that will be using uh, Landfolio framework. So uh, our project team, um, we partnered with Aurora Geoscience. They are an outfit that are based in Yellowknife. And um, we felt it very important to have an on-the-ground presence um, up there. The project manager, a junior business analyst, and a couple of subject matter experts come from the Aurora team. Um, and then it's a very sizable project over multiple years, so um, the Trimble team is, is pretty much across the board. Uh, we've got you know, a number of professional services staff, uh, business analysts, database analysts, et cetera, working on it. 
Um, John's implementation engineering team are doing a lot of integrations for us that I'll chat about. Uh, and then Nick and Toby's team are going to be doing some, um, <coughs> some custom development for this project as well. Okay, uh, so iteration one is uh, lands department. Um, this is a listing of the kind of the key um, um, instruments or tenure types that are going to be managed for lands. Um, 23 workflows across these different types. Um, the one thing that you can do with um, all of these different um, permit types in lands is to apply uh, common processes. Okay, so we are not doing a lot of tenure specific workflows for lands. Okay, so there's a lot of common processes that can apply to all of these different tenure types and where there are subtle differences for things like different fees, we use parameter values, right, um, to get different fee structures in there. And where there are, you know, the occasional requirement for a different uh, a business rule, we can actually use the tenure type as a criteria in a business rule to send it off on a, on a slightly different workflow. Okay, so it's a little different to minerals in that, um, you know, those workflows are typically tenure specific. Here we can apply common workflows uh, but there are a lot of them because there are, are a lot of processes involved. You know, all the way from applications, um, stakeholder consultation with the First Nations, uh, awarding the tenure, uh, you know, renewals, expiry, surrenders, etc. cetera. Um, iteration two is oil and gas. Um, these are the different tenure types um, and processes. So, you know, it's a, it's a little bit of a shorter list. Um, but they've got quite stringent regulations around oil and gas, so 24 workflows have been designed for, uh, for oil and gas. And then we get across to uh, um, the mining iteration. Um, they've got uh, four key tenure types right at the moment. Um, a prospector's license permit, then mineral claims and mineral leases. Those will all have um, tenure specific workflows uh, configured for them. Um, and then um, some processes that are kind of common to all of those, uh, filing of work reports, uh, filing of credit distributions, and assignments. So the one thing um, that is happening with the minerals legislation in the NWT is they are going through a series of regula regulatory changes. Um, those major regulation changes are going to bring a lot of additional processes in. Uh, there's going to be additional stakeholder consultation required. They're actually introducing new tenure types, completely new tenure types. Uh, they're introducing online map staking. Um, and those enhancements, once those regulation changes come into play, are actually going to be a, a separate project, okay, over and above this, uh, this multi-year project that, that we're doing. But the reason that mining is the final iteration is, is to kind of broadly align with uh, within the new regulations that are coming out. So, you know, John just spoke about third-party system integrations. Um, we're doing a number of these. Um, we're integrating with uh, Citizen One, which is a portal authentication which uses uh, the national identifier to, you know, basically validate that a citizen, you know, is a citizen and, uh, and can actually transact. Um, there's a financial integration with PeopleSoft. We're doing document management integration with, uh, with OpenText. Um, we're building a claim, a claim filing wizard for the NWT. Uh, we currently have claim filing wizards for um, Ontario and Quebec. Um, so we're extending that to the, to the NWT. And then I put mobile question mark up there um, as um, that's something that I'd like to see added onto this project. It's not currently part of the scope. But uh, hopefully, you know, using the awesome work that, uh, that Dean and the guys are doing there, um, you know, hopefully convince uh, GNWT to uh, implement mobile because um, in terms of the enforcement um, and compliance sections, there's quite a lot of, uh, you know, quite a lot of uh, inspections and things that are needed as part of the lands processes. Um, so deployment architecture, we've, um, we've got three environments, uh, development, test, and production. They're all being delivered on, um, on uh, GNWT managed servers. Um, and uh, yeah, this is uh, you know, kind of pretty standard for a, for, a, for a government implementation where we're delivering uh, on-premise. On 
So in terms of project timelines, as I mentioned, yeah, it is a it is a large multi-year project. Um, so we, um, you know, we kicked it off in in November 2021 uh, with project kickoff meetings, um, basically getting um, everyone together with, you know, getting buy-in from all of the different uh, departments, and then we started um, the initial lands design work uh, in January of last year. Um, we are um, running a lot of these iterations um, kind of in parallel. So once we get to a certain point uh, within iteration one, we can actually you know, start the subsequent iteration. So um, although iteration one for lands is, um, is going live in a couple of months time, we've actually already started the design work for uh, the oil and gas iteration back in, uh, back in July of last year. Um, we're starting minerals mid-year, um, hoping to have um, oil and gas completed by the end of this year. And then we're currently targeting April 2024 for a system that matches the current regulations. Okay? Um, the project to then tack on the new regulatory changes is probably going to take another 12 to 24 months after that. Anyway, the key message here is that um, this project is, you know, it's a five-year, you know, five-year project, right? Um, that we're that we're in for. Um, so, in, in terms of project milestones, this is just an example of the milestones within um, iteration one. Uh, we've seen a lot of this. It's very similar to um, a lot of the milestones that have been pulled up for some of the other project updates that have been done. Um, one of the differences here. Um, in um, I think the project that we looked at earlier with Malawi, um, it had to get to specific points with deliverables before we could move on to the next iteration. So it was very much a waterfall approach. For this project, we're taking a bit of a hybrid approach where um, we are, because it's, because it's uh, of such a large scale, um, we are trying to get going with certain of the milestones before other milestones are completed. Um, but you know there are some critical things that need to get done, right? Um, that are waterfall, right? We can't do user acceptance testing until training is completed of the users, for example, right? Um, so it's a bit of a hybrid approach there. Okay, um, yeah. So um, there's a back office solution, obviously, along with a framework solution. I've just got a couple of screenshots here um, to show over the last couple of minutes. Um, just a few things to highlight here, um, piggybacking off what Toby spoke about um, in terms of um, new features in Landfolio. Um, so here you can see we've got uh, you know, a customized menu item where um, you're very familiar with having the top section of Landfolio here be called a license, right? In this case, it's, it's called a record. Uh, the next section here, which would typically be for agreements, has re been rebranded um, management. Okay, so just talking to the configurable um, nature of the of the menu items there. Um, moving on to the onto the maps and the GIS, um, the ability to turn layers on and off by default when you're consuming external WMS uh, or WFS services. Critical here, we're consuming a, a service called Atlas, which is a secured. Um, web map service and the ability to kind of turn layers uh, off by default on an individual basis is critical because otherwise this map would be a complete mess when it first popped up to users. So thanks Toby for that one. Uh, and then finally structured data. Um, here's an example of a, um, of a residential lease. Um, and at the top section here we've got a whole lot of, uh, we've got a whole lot of uh, uh, you know, custom structured data uh, related to uh, uh, risk assessment, securities, and improvements that have been made um, on that particular on that particular lease. So, making extensive use of, of structured data. Okay. Um, yeah. Framework. Um, this is uh, this is the um, the dashboard for lands. Um, there are going to be different dashboards for the different um, for the different iterations. So there'll be you know land specific dashboard on a gas-specific dashboard, mineral-specific dashboard, and again, you know, as Nick explained, um, you know, we have a lot of options now in terms of making these web pages look and feel exactly uh, like the customer wants um, based, on the, based on the new framework capability. 
So um, that's what the, the dashboard for lands looks like. Um, this is looking at, uh, at a, a tenure portfolio. Um, a screenshot where we've got pending um, tenure, active tenure, inactive tenure, so all things that you saw earlier on that we've implemented here. Um, this is an example of a detailed view um, of an agricultural lease. So there's an overview which has got general information and you've got your obligations, payments, and documents. Okay, so again, you know, stuff that, we, uh, that we've seen earlier. Um, yeah, and then the final, uh, final screenshot I've got here is, is just one showing, uh, um, showing payments. So we are going to be integrating with uh, a payment gateway called Moneris. Um, it is the most commonly used uh, payment gateway um, in Canada. So uh, that'll be another, another payment gateway that uh, Framework can, can integrate with. And with 10 seconds left, questions? <laughs> Three, two, two eight, one. <laughs> Time's up. <laughs> Thank you, Mike.